Okay. Uh, I want to thank Jeff for inviting me to come and speak here. Uh, I'm going to be talking really about my passion for teaching and the artistry behind hair because a lot of times my colleagues say, oh, you know, hair is so boring. I just don't want to do that. And that's why I'm passionate about teaching. Uh, my disclosure is, yes, I get royalties uh, from my books. Uh, new ones coming out. Uh, well, just there's a mock-up downstairs I just saw it a couple days ago, which I'm excited about. But I've made less than $1,000 total over the last four years, so you understand it's not for the money. Um, you heard John talk about the Norwood classification? Absolutely. This is the start. And this is something that you see all these textbooks and you just gloss over like it's nothing. It's critical. I was sitting next to a colleague of mine in San Diego in an aging face course about three years ago, and he says, I can tell every transplant ever done. I go, the guy in front of you has a transplant, the guy next to you has a hairpiece. He goes, there's no way, I don't see it. And this is what Malcolm Gladwell talks about, is 10,000 hours it takes you to start seeing things. It's just like you will see a fake nose out there and other people won't even know what you're talking about. Spend the time, understand the normal classification. Without understanding that, you're not gonna be able to create beautiful work. Just to take a step back, you heard this earlier from John, this is a progression from terminal thick hairs to vellus hairs to no hair. And that is the natural loss that goes forward. And so you can stop it, you can slow it down, not stop it, you can slow it down, reverse some of it. And so medicine is also important. We tend to just be, as, as surgeons, focus so much on the surgical element, we forget about, the, about the, the medical side. And so this is something we're gonna talk more about in just a couple minutes here. And the idea is it is an ever-dwindling supply of hair with ever-increasing demand. And so this is why that, that crystal ball you saw in John's talk about fo uh, focusing on the future is absolutely important. Nowadays, it's not just finasteride and minoxidil. There's, to me, I, I use laser technology. I use, and I use a PRP, platelet-rich plasma, and A-cell, which is a, a A-cellular porcine matrix, to help restore and regrow hair. So that, remember that slide with the vellus hairs, you wanna recapture some of those hairs and slow it down, especially when you're dealing with a younger gentleman and you're really worried about that person losing so much that his demand will outstrip his su supply. So always, always understand the mechanics of, of medicine out there and help that person, even with camouflaging products that are available today, such as magnetic wool fibers of different brands that can help make a hair look thicker. So offer your patient solutions beyond surgery. Classically, we talk about the rule of thirds to restore where the hairline is. I, I don't like this uh, definition because I think there's a lot more variability. Um, I tend to talk about this shingling point where the hair transitions from a vertical to a horizontal hairline as the lowest acceptable point. And that's the first thing I do is draw that point. And from that point, you can always move up or down. The risk of going, I'm sorry, you can't go down, but if you go down, it's gonna look fake. You can move it up if you're dealing with the more conservative design pattern. But the fear is you lose the aesthetic benefit to a face, which is the frame that you're gonna derive. So that just like a beautiful nose brings out the, the beauty of the eyes and you don't see the, the nose, a good hair restoration makes a face look 10, 15, 20 years younger and you don't notice it. And that's really the beauty of this. Um, different shapes. This is really, really important is to design shapes based on a person's ethnicity, facial shape, and that's where some of the artistry comes in. I think it's really important to be able to, to create a shape that looks good for a person, that works well for them. And the key thing is a lot of times we don't think about balance when we're doing hair. We draw this really nice frontal hairline and then if the temples are really far recessed, the person may not, may not look right and so that area B, what you're seeing is that gray, if you put that hairline far forward, the temple hairs that are recessed may not look right. But the, the one caveat is temple res restoration is a very advanced topic and I, I would say you shouldn't be even consider to do that unless you've been at least five years in practice with a good uh, number of cases under your belt because it's easy to make someone look weird. Uh, the side view is to me very important as well because the side view as you look at the person, it should slope up or be somewhat flat. And when I teach my course in, in St. Louis, I always see the failure is, is not just the fact that the hairline should terminate at the lateral canthus, which oftentimes the, the, the rudimentary basics, but people don't look at it from all angles. So I encourage you as you design your hairline, go to all angles and look at it. And one thing really fun is when I teach a workshop with this, you know, drawing the, the hairline with the basics, I'll have a slide with, you know, the basic principles of how to do a hairline, uh, and then you can't even get that done. But once you get that done, 
Then I really like engaging, you know, how old is this person? What's the ethnicity? What's the gender? What is the degree of hair loss? What is the curl? What is the donor density? All these factors actually play into how you're going to design that person's hairline. And that's where that artistry and experience comes to play. And I think it's absolutely fun. So I can't teach you how to draw a hairline, and I don't think you care to learn a hairline in five minutes, but you care to understand the complexity and the beauty that's behind it. The one thing that I will say is that beyond just drawing a line in and following the principles, a lot of times, if you just look at the hairline, it can look skewed. And the reason that I've thought about this is that the scalp topography is uneven. And so when you draw a hairline that looks straight to you on a 3D world, when the person looks in the mirror or in a photograph, it can look skewed. So what I use is I use a mirror and just try to balance and merge the, 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 the straightness from a 2D to a 3D world. And also the other thing I've been doing is I close one eye to take out the stereoscopic uh, perspective and it flattens that perspective really quickly. And it's really good if you start drawing that line in and within a minute just double check it straight before you go into 5-15 minutes of drawing that hairline and then realizing it's way off. You know, so that's, that's a nice small pearl. Um, and then the other thing is important is that scalp topography where the hairs grow in various regions of the head grow in different angles and directions and that's so important to know what these region, regional, regions of the, of the scalp are. Uh, and so I, I've created this little model uh, I wrote in my book that I think helps people that are starting out to understand where the regions divide out. And if you think of the head instead of as a sloping round configuration but as a square, you can look at the, the transition as you heard earlier from the horizontal to vertical plane being the hairline. And then there's the crown is the vertical scope, this vertical plane on the back. And I call, call that well, everyone calls that is the vertex transition point or tr vertex transition zone, almost like a posterior hairline as it curves down to the crown. And then the temple hair that transition from mid scalp over to the temple bearing hair is known as the lateral crease. And so these are just conceptual elements that, again, you're not going to learn all this in five minutes. It's not the intention of this talk. Is but to in, it really implore you to think about the complexity of hair rather than just going there and sticking graphs up on a head because you know better. Because, hey, I can do rhinoplasty, therefore hair is for retarded people. And the goal is to have you understand the complexity that's there is really the prerequisite to understanding how to create great results. And this is the different directions and angles that grow in all parts of the head. If you don't know what this is, go look at someone's scalp close up that is not losing hair but has maybe a closely shorn hair, hair and you can start seeing the angles are, are easily transitioning slowly in all different areas, which brings me to discuss recipient side creation, which you can use different instruments. For the sake of easiness, I'm just going to talk about I say sake of ease, I'm just going to talk about using needles. But you can use almost a lot of different ways of doing this. And we'll go through some ideas here of how to create it. You can use, this is more advanced, you can use little punches to create sites. And this, the key though is making angles really low in the front because if the angles are too high, they don't create visual density because you can see through them. They don't create a, a shingle of, of, uh, of, of uh, shadow that's there. And also it's, it's, it can look pluggy, even graphs that are one or two hairs because they're not angled right. Uh, so to do this, having a person in a supine position allows your, your ha hand to naturally fall in a very low anterior angle. So that's something really important when you're designing the recipient side portion of the hairline. The forelock is that aesthetic power because if a person has see-through right in this area, it looks bald. And so where the focus I have is creating a beautiful hairline because that's a frame to the face and making sure there's adequate density in this area called the central forelock. Now, if you just put everything up on the front, then they look weird because it doesn't follow a norward pattern. So these are all the things that you need to juggle as you design your, your work. So there are three ways, you know, to do recipient sites. The parallel sagittal techniques is the way I do most of my sites. It's an easy way to do it. It allows you not to have a minimal transection of your, of your uh, hair. But when you start to get to larger graphs, such as three or four hair graphs, you can, the, the, the perpendicular or coronal sites have some advantage is the fact that when the hairs, if you think about the three hairs that grow out like this, they create more visual uh, density by having them line up like this rather than like this because they're more of a shadow effect on the scalp. Because remember the goal of good hair restoration is to cover bald scalp and it creates more of an awning if you will. So there's different ways to do this. You can do this and this is the, the nice thing is you have tools in your belt that you can do different things. Micro punch, the benefit of it is that you can take some bald scalp out and reduce the, the, vis the visual element of that. But it's a more advanced thing and you can have problems if you're just starting out using uh, micro punches. 
this is the idea that the angle, the direct is, is, when I talk about angle, I'm talking about how that recipient site goes in this perspective, direction goes this way, and then tilt is a more advanced topic that really doesn't apply to maybe 95% of cases, so we won't go through that. This is just showing you a hairline close up using sagittal sites or uh, parallel sites. And you can see that there's, it's irregularly irregular. And there are these, these little one hair sentinel graphs that sort of fly out there. And those, this is those that it further obscures and blurs that hairline. So you really don't want a straight line. You want this as irregular as possible. And that creates a natural result. This is, I just draw that irregularity that's going forward and I further irregularize it by making these sites for two hair graphs, which is what you heard John talk about. And then I, finesse it by building up my one hair graphs and further make it irregular. I constantly, with every step from drawing the line to making the first round to the next round, I'm constantly making it more and more irregular as I proceed. And then I build up density with two and three hair graphs uh, or sites that would accommodate those graphs further back. Uh, these are just different patterns. You can see that there's no abrupt angle changes. There's a slight tra uh, transition from each part. You don't ever see this when you, when you build a site. You want to slowly blend, and that's really, really important. Uh, this is a combination, as you see here, with sagittal parallel sites anteriorly, and then the coronal sites or perpendicular sites in the middle. Why do that? One, it's easier for my, my assistants to place because they know which ones are two and three hairs. Number two is that I create, I leverage that density uh, that you can get with those stronger three hair graphs. Do I do this every time? No. This is the artistry and it's a creativity that's so fun when you're designing sites is I love designing things. The point of this slide is if you notice what I've been doing more recently is on the, in the hairline, they converge into the middle. And the reason you want to have some convergence pattern is that it allows you to have the hairs focus into that central forelock so that you get more visual density in the area rather than having them going uh, forward. Uh, this is just showing again two things, the, the gradual transition going to the temple hair. And then I'm using those perpendicular sites so that the, the, um, the, graphs are, the, the, the graphs fit really snugly into the temple hair and they are actually they can lie flatter. I didn't mention that, but it's another advantage of the, the, the perpendicular sites. I'm not here to teach you how to do all this, in, but I just want you to see the complexity and the beauty and the artistry, and that's really the goal of this. The crown, not only am I showing you a world, but you can see that it, there's no abrupt transitions. Everything blends out, and that's really my passion. Is, is I love doing hair because it's a lot of fun. It creates nice transitions. This is another crown where most of it is vertical, going up, and, it's, and the other one you saw is mainly circular. So this is what you can do to, to have beautiful patterns that work for a patient. A female hairline is completely different. They almost go backwards and they sweep in a, in a very, very different angulation shape, which is a more advanced idea. And then micro punches are an alternative way to create uh, recipient sites, as you see here. And this is just showing after the graphs being placed. And this is at the end of each procedure on the electronic medical record, I will actually draw for uh, the pattern and show where I put different uh, graphs. And the reason I do this is twofold. One, it's a record for, for the patient in the future to come back and see where things worked or didn't work. And the second reason is my staff are able to place more uh, easily into this design pattern because I've showed them my blueprint of where I put what I did, where I did it, and how many graphs and they can, or how many sites so that they can more easily place into that pattern design. So if you look, the first gentleman on the, on the left, he's had a transplant, but the line is too straight. The graphs almost look like pubic hair because they're, they've been mishandled and, and, and aggressively inserted. So this is why the assistant staff is so important, and this is a correction. And you see here, you can see these are actually not plugs. They look like plugs, but the hair graphs are compressed. They don't fit into the site well. And they're too large a graph for the front hairline. And the hairline is too straight. And the angles are too high. And the temple hair doesn't match. And all this is in a post-plug era uh, result. So you can see this. If you think, oh, I'll just make small follicular unit graphs and get good results, there's so much more level complexity. And that's part of what I want you to understand from this. And this, you can see, graphs are too large, hairline is too straight, no visual density, doesn't match the temple hair, uh, uh, graphs are, if I didn't mention that, graphs are large in the hairline, and this is just a, a, a correction. So do you see how it looks like a picket fence? And these are not plugs. This is after the era of plugs. So I've been using PRP, it's the best thing I've done in 10 years in terms of being able to get uh, more consistent graph growth, earlier graph growth, and patients who serve as their own controls, I've had tremendous success in, in getting those patients that have moderate growth, have excellent growth on a second round using this technology. This is just injecting the uh, PRP and the A-cell into the crown. 
uh, use robotic FUE as well. This is another alternative. You'll hear a little bit from Gorna about her, uh, her, her uh, ability to do FUE. I think I've heard a lot of brilliant ideas of what she's going to talk about. So I end with this talk about understanding that hair can be fun, it can be artistic, and it can be wonderful. Thank you.